during the interwar years, the United States Navy was particularly fond of its fleet problems. Those large training exercises focused as much on testing new concepts as actually training the fleet. Not really a surprising note in all honesty. The 1920s and 1930s were a time of great change in naval technology. The submarine continued to come into its own. Destroyers were getting larger and more effective by the day. Newer cruisers presented more options in battle formation. And, of course, the aircraft carrier was entering the picture. That last one is very important for Fleet Problem 12. In this one, the main idea was testing how a fleet with strong carrier backing would fare against a strong battle fleet. Fleet Problem 12 took place in 1931 when the Navy only had three aircraft carriers, Langley and the two Lexingtons, and even Lex and Sarah were functionally brand new, having entered service in 1927. As such, the idea of testing how do aircraft carriers impact the fleet balance was definitely a logical one. No one, and I do mean no one, was quite sure of that yet. And more than a few old admirals looked at the big carriers with a critical eye. Short of direct combat action, hello the later Pacific War, this was the best way to test how good they really were. So the Navy came up with a plan. They would pit two fleets against each other. One would have the Lexingtons for the strongest concentrated carrier force, while the other one would be built primarily around a large number of battleships to present a more traditional option, partially because of a third brown force that was a hypothetical third power, one that was neutral but could ally with either side forcing Blue Force to keep a lot of forces in New England, thus resulting in the heavy focus on air power. There were also interesting details like a hypothetical Nicaraguan canal nearing completion, just to throw further wrenches into the works. Either way, the fleets would be thrown against each other off the coast of Panama in a mass mock engagement to not only test the potential of aircraft carriers, but also the ability of the fleet to defend the Panama Canal. So, with that background sorted, let's move on to the fleet problem itself, starting with the fleets in question. As noted, there were two involved here. Blue Force would represent the United States on defense of Panama. This grouping would, at the same time, test the ability of an aviation-heavy force in such a role. Blue Force would be built around Lexington and Saratoga with USS Arkansas providing the sole heavy guns. In support, the fleet had four aircraft tenders, nine light cruisers, and 22 destroyers, along with the airship USS Los Angeles to test her out as well. Shore-based aircraft were also allowed to help to further the point of the exercise. This gave a fairly strong concentration of air power, especially for 1931. Although the counterpoint was that Blue Force only had Arkansas for heavy surface combats. Though they did have 10 submarines and a substantial logistics training. Black Force, by contrast, represented Japan in the scenario, with the stated goal of destroying both of the canals. With this fleet built around no fewer than nine battleships, one small carrier, Langley, and four aircraft tenders of their own, with four heavy cruisers and 29 destroyers, along with four submarines. Keep those in mind for later. 
In addition, the fleet was escorting a mock force of 15,000 infantry and 200 hypothetical boxed aircraft. Should those troops get ashore, it was assumed they'd quickly establish airfields for further air support. That being said, the fleet itself had less than 80 aircraft. But in a surface action, let's just say that old Arky wasn't soloing nine battleships and four heavy cruisers. Probably not even the cruisers, being honest, since at this point, they still had their torpedoes. Because of this disparity in force and the experimental nature of it all, this fleet problem became a bit of a media circus. Both the Secretary and Assistant Secretary of the Navy were present to observe, along with the CNO, the Chief of Naval Operations, and several ships from the Royal Navy, up to and including their flagship of the Atlantic Fleet, HMS Nelson. Regardless, that brings us to the fleet problem itself. Both fleets were in their predetermined positions by February 15, 1931. Black Fleet was 850 nautical miles southwest of the Gulf of Panama. Admiral Frank Schofield split his force into three different groups. Two convoys escorted by the battleships, two heavy cruisers, and some of the destroyers. These had the mission of landing in Central America to establish air bases. The remaining cruisers, along with the submarines, would form a scouting force to find and destroy the Blue Force carriers. This worked to divide attention, though the Admiral aboard Arkansas, one Arthur Willard, would decide to focus on the landing force portion of the Black Force, a softer target than the battleships themselves, while fulfilling the primary objective of the entire affair. Sinking the enemy fleet was all well and good, but the main goal was defending the canals, both real and hypothetical. It was also a logical decision to make in the face of Blue's severe lack of big guns. Willard would keep his sole battleship, Arkansas, off the coast of Panama. The carriers, meanwhile, were formed into a striking force under Admiral Joseph Reeves. The main offensive thrust, with Reeves splitting his fleet into two task forces, one based on Lexington and the other on Saratoga. Each carrier would get two cruisers and four destroyers for escort to seek out and destroy the enemy transports. To this effect, Admiral Reeves aboard Saratoga would sail west and northwest of Panama to cover the hypothetical Nicaragua Canal. Lexington, under the rather more famous Captain Ernst J. King, would cover the Panama Canal. To scout for Black Force, the remaining cruisers and destroyers formed a scouting line, with the submarines and Los Angeles in support. The aircraft tenders, meanwhile, were kept close to shore as a backup. Thus, the stage was set for Fleet Problem 12 to truly kick off. Operations began on February 16, 1931. During the evening and into February 17, both fleets performed scouting operations, with the only sighting on the 17th being a black destroyer sighting the airship Los Angeles. On the 18th, meanwhile, blue flying boats spotted larger black forces. Airstrikes led by USS Wright would go in, though those proved largely ineffective. Soon enough, though, one of the two big convoys was spotted in turn. Five battleships, a cruiser, ten destroyers, and five transports. At around the same time, Black Force detached Pensacola and Northampton to make a high-speed raid 
on the coast of Panama, sinking a minesweeper and oiler in exchange for further unsuccessful airstrikes. While making a speedy exit, the pair of cruisers would run across Arkansas, steaming straight towards them. The three ships would trade salvos, though this would prove decidedly ineffective on both ends. Arkansas would not land any simulated hits on the cruisers, nor would they do the same to her. The battleship was too slow to close the range, while the cruisers could easily disengage when they wanted. Moreover, Pensacola and Northampton actually had the range advantage. Arkansas's guns had lower elevation. Fortunately for the old battleship, the cruisers had their own problems with the rough weather. This wasn't great, and the cruisers were having issues with their catapults as well, making it impossible to use their scouts. This made their long-range fire inaccurate and ineffective. Well, even more ineffective than peppering a battleship with 8-inch shells at range would already have been. Still, Arkansas couldn't catch up as they retreated. Now for the carriers, those were demonstrating the difficulty of early carrier operation. Black's convoys managed to sail between Lex and Sarah without being spotted, at least at first. On the morning of the 19th, a scout from Saratoga spotted one of the convoys. Airstrikes and supporting thrusts from cruisers and destroyers did, and I quote, modest damage. The other convoy, for its part, would be sighted by a scout from the Lexington Group, along with Los Angeles. Now both the scout and the airship were ruled as downed in turn, but not before getting messages off. Captain King would launch attacks that hit Langley, though he had to turn Lexington's light on that night to help recover aircraft. Shades of the later Battle of the Philippine Sea right there. Unfortunately, further airstrikes did little to slow the convoys. It was ruled that one pushed through and managed a landing, along with establishing a shore base. To rub salt into the wound, a submarine managed to nail Arkansas on the evening of February 19th. This was ruled as sufficient hypothetical damage to sink the battleship, which removed her from the remainder of the exercise. I'm fairly certain that American submariners would wish they could pull that off a decade later. Anyway, with Arkansas and Willard out of the battle, it fell entirely on the carriers under Admiral Reeves to attempt to stop Black Force, which the umpires ruled a failure. During the night of the 19th, the carriers encountered surface forces. They were forced to operate far ahead due to the short range of early carrier-borne aircraft. Fortunately, Lex and Sarah managed to use their speed advantage to pull away, along with brave offensive action by their escorts. Shades of Leyte Gulf this time, minus the fast carriers use speed to pull away part. However, despite that escape, Lexington will be caught again later on February 20th, within 30,000 yards of the escort for the second black convoy. Lexington managed to launch an airstrike to sink Pensacola after she had, in turn, sunk a light cruiser. The black battleships, meanwhile, bullied their way through, sinking Wright and two more light cruisers in the process. The convoy would make it to shore and establish a second base, with the final actions of Fleet Problem 12 coming in a further strike by Lexington that damaged Langley and a few battleships, while Lexington's escorts sank Northampton. At this point, the problem came to an end. Black Force was ruled the victor due to achieving their main objective 
of landing forces in Central America. Now then, with this done, what did Fleet Problem 12 demonstrate? First, that carriers could be used defensively and offensively, but that their aircraft weren't quite up to the task yet, prompting dangerous close approaches. Carriers would need at least a couple cruisers and some destroyers to provide close escort. Whereas battleships, while certainly vulnerable to airstrikes, could still push their way through. It was not yet the time for the aircraft carrier, though the signs were already there. Fleet Problem 12, in many ways, pointed the way to the future. I'd argue it's more important in the long run than the much memed on attack on Pearl Harbor fleet problem. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And I'll see you in the next one.